Hey guys, back again with another installment of the Football Apex Podcast, here with Elliot. Now this week is really special, because Cristiano Ronaldo could break the all-time goal-scoring record that he shares with Joseph Buchan at you know 759 goals if he scores against Inter Milan. Now Elliot, how emotionally you know historic would that achievement be because of the Calciopoli scandal and Inter-Juve having that rivalry? You know, what would it mean for Ronaldo to break that record against them tomorrow? Um, I think just because it's gets injured, it would, it, it would intensify everything because they have a big rivalry there. Um, Juventus fans are in the perception that that Inter are, lo- are out of the title race before a ball is kicked. That's just the mentality they have about Inter. Uh, and then obviously Inter talk about the 2010 uh, Champions League final that they won. So I think the ri- the fact that it's it's a rivalry, even though it's not a derby, but it, it's, it's a rivalry that um, is very intense. I think the fact that Ronaldo – you know, if Ronaldo scores in that game, I think it'd be special. And I just reckon, just because they have gotten them a lot of the season, that they'll get a they'll get a penalty at some point in this game, and Ronaldo will will be able to do that. Um, whether it will be a great Ronaldo performance, I don't think will largely affect the impact of him scoring. So he can play a horrible game and get one goal, and no one will ever remember that. Except I won't remember what kind of goal he's gonna get. Because like, what I mean is like, you remember when Barca played Juve? Yeah. Yeah, the second the second game in the camp in the new camp. Yeah. And Ronaldo, you know, on the scoreboard, two goals. Ronaldo played great. No, man. That's all he did. Awful. Awful. They defended. And let's see, what was it? Two penalties. Uh he fouled Messi. And that's pretty much it. But hey, on the scoreboard. Got yeah, but enough. if you go back and if when people talk about because that prop quote unquote could be the last game those two ever play against each other, if you really think about it, if you go all the way back, if, if we're five, ten years from now and you think about Ronaldo's record breaking goal, they're not gonna remember that he played like crap for 80 minutes and have one penalty. They're just gonna remember the fact that he scored. You know what I mean? Like I'll remember because I watched the game, but for people who didn't watch the game and are thinking in the future, you know, they won't. You know, they're not going to look back at the fact that, oh, it was a dominating performance or he just he broke the record that day. That's yeah, all or, I agree with you. I'll tell you why. When Miroslav Klose broke the World Cup all-time score record for with 16 goals ahead of R9, he scored four against Saudi Arabia in the 2002 World Cup. No one ever remembers that. They only remember the goal against Brazil or, for example, the header against Argentina. Or should I say, he scored quite a few times against Argentina. They remember those. But they don't remember like a little bit of stat padding or like the forgotten intangibles of like, I remember I remember the Saudi past. Arabia game too. They won that six nil. <laughs> Eight nil. Eight nil. Eight. And it, those are things that people forget. For example, Mbappe has not scored, I believe, in the Champions League. Okay, he broke it in the last group game with the penalty and a tap in. No, but he hasn't scored a knockout game since Monaco. Yeah, yeah, he hasn't scored in a while. No one's really going to remember that because of what Mbappe is capable of doing. Right. Um, they're probably not going to remember his Champions League final misses if he had won the game. Yeah, same goes for, like, um, Holland. He um, he scored in some big Champions League games, obviously, but they're not going to remember him being shut out by a completely average defender in, in um, John Brooks at Wolfsburg in uh, his first season. They're going to mm-hmm. remember what he did against Liverpool, and they're going to remember what he did in the Champions League Um uh, knockout rounds and things like that. They're not going to remember the the little details of. Remember when an average defender made him look average? You know what I mean. So yeah. it's just oh. like it's just like one of those things where it's just like. So obviously it's 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 one way or another, but um, you look at that one one part of it. They're not going to remember that really specific detail, unless you you're going to remember games, you know, uh, ten years from now. Speaking of remembering, like you bring up a good point. The biggest meme is Joe, uh, Jerome Boateng getting floored by Messi in the 2015 Champions League semifinal. Yeah. But the year before, he had just shut out Messi to win the World Cup. Like, come on, man. Those are levels. But yeah. why? Why do people not talk about the World Cup final? Like, Boateng's entire discography, I guess, or like yeah. his career, they don't ever mention the World Cup final performance. They mention, like, the trophies he's won. Or the, games he's played or the, uh, the clearance uh, against... Um, because Ukraine in the Euros. Ukraine. When, when Boateng retires, that's the one moment I can remember because of how sick that was. Yeah. Not, not to mention, I mean, it was significant even though they didn't win the tournament. But that yeah, year but they, they lost on penalties, didn't they? No, no. They beat Italy on penalties. Oh, they lost, they lost, they lost to France. France. They lost to France. Well, uh, but he was still solid. If anything, I think that was when he was hitting his prime. I think Boateng hit his prime in 2016. 
Yeah. Best defender in the world for me. And Bonucci with Ramos and PK. That was a great year for defenders. Yeah. Um, but that gets me thinking legacy wise. Yeah. You know, let's let us let us let us keep it German themed. Mario okay. Gotze, yeah. World Cup final goal. I was just watching actually Germany against Ghana, the group stage highlights, the one that ended 2 2, on how Gutze heads the ball into his knee and scores. Yeah. <laughs> will will Gutze be remembered as a legend 20 years from now? Only for Germany, because he scored that goal. Not for right. Bayern Munich, not for Dortmund, not for, I mean, maybe he will for PSV if he keeps scoring. <laughs> but but uh, for in terms of a Bundesliga legend, he's definitely not. And that might be harsh because he had he did have some really good years with Dortmund. And his first year with Bayern was pretty good. Um, under Pep Guardiola, he was much better than he was under uh, the other managers that he had played for. Uh, then he goes back to Dortmund, and he's not the same Dortmund goes that they saw the first time. Then he just left for free to go to, to Holland. But be, just because of that goal, he'll be a legend for German football because no German human being, you know, child or adult, will ever forget that moment. Um, so that moment will, will, will sting or f for Argentina will sting forever. And for, um, for Germany, it will, it will always be in the back of your head of sort of that moment. So he'll be, a, he'll let, be a legend only for Germany, but again, only because of that one moment, not because of the collective. Um, that makes sense. But like, what would you take it? Like if you were Mario Götze, would you be okay with your career? <laughs> I mean, okay with scoring a, a World Cup final in the 117th minute to beat Argentina, Leo Messi. I mean, yeah, I'd be okay with that. Uh, would I rather have Messi's career than Goat says? Yes. Oh. <laughs> but, 99% of people say yes. But I'm not going to – I'm not going to – it's nothing to sneeze at. That moment is, is unreplaceable. Even – if anything, like, even his peers must be jealous. Like, Gutsy, of all people, is the one to get the goal. And it yeah. was no – it was no tapping. It was a self-made goal. Well, yeah. courtesy of Andre Scherler's brilliant lob. Yeah. But what's it? Chest. Left. But he chest the left and, left. and hits it with his other foot and bang, game over for Messi and, and um, Argentina. Uh, I remember Let's the commentator you. on that game said, um, when Goat say, they said, oh, sorry, for, for um, closer, when he comes, when he comes off, they said, um, he said, uh, he comes off for the very last time. And then one of the other notes says, it's, is an opportunity for somebody to be a hero. And then he was the substitution, and then he goes to scores the game. I, I just I think that was just such a – it was such an artistic moment, and that was amazing. But, again, he's only a legend because of that, that one goal. But still, it's, it's what you dream about. Elliot, let's just close our eyes for a sec and imagine you're in a World Cup final, 116th minute, Argentina, yeah. nil. Yeah. You got the ball, you chest it down, you hit it, and it hits the back of the net. And yeah. what, is there three minutes left? Argentina, we're not going to score after that. <laughs> yeah. Give them, no, no, no. I, it was... Right. I visualized that moment pretty much regularly since then. In this situation, it's the United States against Romania, and it's <laughs> tied up, and then I, you know, I score the game-winning goal. I celebrate in front of all my American uh, friends and supporters. <laughs> and point to that. Like, you know, that, that, that moment of ecstasy that you finally did it? Um, obviously, that would be the most improbable World Cup final ever. But, you know, you, <laughs> when you saw that goal, it's like, I want a moment like that. The Iniesta one is, is awesome, too. But a defensive mistake kind of, like, gave it to him in that situation. I think it was Hatinga or Vandervaart. I don't know. I what don't remember. Was. But it was – the, the Gotse one was a much more difficult goal to score in, in that moment, where it was created by the pass but also by the finish, where Iniesta's finish was brilliant – but there was um, – it was a poor defensive clearance by the defense. If they don't clear, Yeah, if they don't clear that ball out, they go to penalties, and then you don't know what happens. So, Holland could have won that tournament if it wasn't for that. But, again, so the Spain still could have. But that, that singular moment set up the goal where Gotze's moment was like nothing was happening after that. It was over. For sure. But, um, yo, let's keep it on the World Cup final theme. Sometimes I think of the Robin chance against yeah. Casillas. If these scores, did the Netherlands win the World Cup? Wait, which World Cup are you talking about? 2010, 2010? FIFA World Cup final, Netherlands, Spain, when Aryan Robin goes one on one with Casillas, and off the, you know, his toenail, Casillas saves the ball. It's hard to say because 
we can look back at certain moments, but that doesn't mean this, the, that the, the match would have went the way it did following that. I think this is my opinion. I think they would have won the game pro probably, but I think Spain would have gotten an equalizer. That's just my view. Because I think when, 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 when you say, if this didn't happen, if it does happen, the entire complexion of the rest of the game is different. Yes. It's not yes. like you have the same game, but this. It's not like you, a penalty is missed or a penalty is not given and, and something happens. Then it's pretty much the same thing. But when you score a goal like that, and that was in the second half, if I'm correct, right? Mm -hmm. Was it late in the second half or? 70th minute, 70th. That's pretty yeah. late to me. Just because of this, the strength of Sp this Spain, I thought I, th I feel like they'd get a, that goal may have happened, may not have happened in that way, but I think they would have got an equalizer late, and then my guess is it would it would have gone into um, deeper into extra time or whatever, um, and then they would have figured it out. But but I think it's possible. But again, if you take that moment, that doesn't necessarily mean that the res that everything the, the way the match is played is like the same. It, it becomes different. I think of Van Persie against Argentina which in my opinion was one of the most brilliantly scripted games I've ever seen. It's the best 0-0 draw of all time. I, I'll take that to my bank just because the, the Netherlands were such an attacking minded setup and it was, it was attack after attack after attack. And then the back line of Argentina kept just swatting their balls away and, and basically collapsing their, their chances. But there was one chance in that game where Robin Ben Percy, it wasn't a one-on-one, -on -one, but it was in the box in good space. And I believe he, he was either saved or he hit the bar or something like that. It was very close to scoring. If he scores that, I think, and that's it, just, in, just to give it another example, I think that uh, then the Netherlands definitely would have gone through regardless because Argentina's entire game plan and approach was to, to close line the attack. And, and even though the attack was coming, they weren't providing much in that way. So if, if Robin Van Persie scores, then the entire Argentina team would have to adjust the way they were playing because it, it would have gone against the grain because I think they were going for sort of defending well, but also dictating the midfield and hope, hopefully getting that one goal to, to, to sort of see it out. But if Van Persie scores and the Netherlands beat Argentina, uh, and then, and then you, you look at a Germany-Netherlands um, Germany, um, final in, in, uh, in the World Cup final, in my opinion. Oof. And not to mention the Arjen Robin one that gets saved by Mascherano. We've all seen this one, right? Yeah. Which he almost pulls, I think he pulls in muscle doing that. But then he played the final. So, hey, that's just the kind of commitment that Mascherano had. You know, that's actually, now that I think about it, one of the most underrated aspects to that World Cup, Argentina's defense. Mm -hmm. Because I don't think they conceded many goals. They conceded one in the final. quarter, One nil against Switzerland. Yeah. Let's see. One they nil against Belgium. They conceded two against Nigeria. Oh yeah, those were both from um, Musa, I believe. Yeah, so they, they that was I, I believe if I'm not mistaken, that was the most that was the 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 it was the only time in the tournament they they conceded more than more than once. Because Switzerland was round of sixteen. Um, who was quarterfinals? Belgium. Belgium in the quarterfinals, they won one that Higuain scored. That was a one nil game. Then you had Netherlands in the semis, and then you no, won no. the final. So it was like outside of the the group. I mean, if, if you take the group, you have the two against Nigeria, and I think they just wiped the floor with everybody else. So the two against Nigeria, it was the one against Germany, and that's it. Hmm. Wow. That it requires. And by the way, if Argentina had won that World Cup, I don't think anyone could say that they didn't deserve it. They played their hearts out. They weren't the most entertaining team, but no. they deserved, if they had won the game, to be called champions, world champions. I think – I also think it would it would have killed the GOAT debate. Because oh, yeah. I always think about that. I, I, I think video... generally – sorry. I, con mm. I didn't mind. Continue. I didn't mean to cut I, I just made a video on Cristiano Ronaldo and Lionel Messi, the Ballon d'Or, yeah. you know, back and forth. And at one point, it was four to Messi, one to Cristiano Ronaldo. Yeah. He won his second, but then Messi would have won his fifth. And it would have been at the 2014 World Cup, which was Ronaldo's year. They won it the decima. They had had a great season. Mm -hmm. So for Messi to win the World Cup and take that Ballon d'Or without a doubt over Ronaldo, yeah. after a bad season, it would have just killed the debate because it would have gone to show that Messi could have a crap. I, st I still effort. think it's about 67. This is just the number I was thinking of. I think 67% of people think Messi's the GOAT. 
and I think the rest, it's it's Maradona, Cruyff, um, R9, Cristiano, um, Maldini, who, whoever, just just regardless. But I think 67% of the people think that, that Messi is the greatest. Um, if they if he wins the World Cup, I think it's like 90, 80. 10, 80 to 90 percent because there'll be some mi- bitter Madrid fans who will never acknowledge that. There's Mar- probably Maradona, not Argentina Maradona fans, but just uh, people who are just fans of Maradona who will never who will say that he was still better. But outside of that, if he had won that World Cup, I think the debate would have been over. Like the de- the goat debate will never be undisputed. Not just in soccer, but in in the basketball with LeBron and MJ, in um, in the majority of sports, I actually believe it's only undisputed. And this this is a weird thing to bring up, but um, and I'm not just saying this because I'm a Romanian, but um, yeah. the gymnastics when you when you typically talk to people in the gymnastics world, people who are who are educated in the sport, everyone it's pretty much undisputedly says uh, Nadia Kamichi is the goat in that sport. But that's the only sport I see that there's not somebody else. Cause even in like sports like tennis, some people say Federer, other people say no. And then Agassi. And again, I don't know a ton about tennis, but if you look at all the sports, there's, there's hardly any undisputed go. It used to be, basketball used to be pretty much undisputed, but then it started not to be. And so if, if he wins that World Cup, it becomes probably the second sport, you can argue the first, that um, had a, person who is clearly above everyone else in terms of that because if you just looked at a comp if, comp if you threw out accomplishments and you just said who plays the best football who's the, the, the most skilled footballer ever it's messy by far it's messy. but because you add the accomplishments and the disappointments into the recipe then some people will take that away from him because if he's the goat you know people make those arguments but i think messy wins that world cup it's over for me and I'm kind of glad Messi didn't win that World Cup final. And what I mean by that is, like, he had a motive to keep going. Because, yeah. like, we all know if you're the GOAT and everyone knows you're the GOAT, Messi wouldn't have as many goals as he has right now. I'm sure yeah. of it. He wouldn't have that push. But because, you know, Ronaldo and all the other GOAT count candidates yeah. dodged a bullet with that one, thanks to courtesy of Mario Götze, you know, it kind of elongated the Ronaldo-Messi rivalry, at least mm-hmm. the narrative in media. and it rewrote history. Messi would have had 10 Ballon d'Ors. Messi would have had 10 Ballon d'Ors if he won that World Cup final. Because when Ronaldo cried in the 2013 FIFA Ballon d'Or ceremony, it's because he knew like it, it was going to take Messi injured, Real Madrid, oh, well, 69 goals that year. Yeah. And eventually, eventually La Decima with the Copa del Rey to beat Messi. Because it wasn't about being the best player in the world. It was about being better than the best who has ever done it. And so I, I believe Ronaldo, while he is self-entitled to believe that he is the greatest player ever, or less, at least that's what he aims to, to end his career as. Yeah, he believes he, he is. Knows, he knows Messi could and probably is. And by probably, I mean like, even on the goals front, Ronaldo's record is 69 goals. Yeah. Messi's is 91. Yeah. What is that? 20, 22 goals. And think about this: intellectual football fans don't even see Messi as a goal scorer. They see him as more of a creator. They see as again, I'll say this: I've said this a bunch. Ronaldo is the most gifted goal scorer I've ever seen. That yeah. that includes everybody. Again, if you're talking about the most complete goal scorer of all time, I would take Puskas. But I'm, I'm when you're talking about gifted, I'm talking about exactly what Ronaldo is. He's very, he's the most gifted goal scorer I've ever seen. And when you're talking about the camera you're not talking about the most complete goal scorer and that those can be two different things, but, but he's the most gifted goal scorer in football history. End of no questions asked in my opinion. And Messi's highest, uh, whatever year total was 91. And he's not look, he's not considered, he's, he's, he scores a bunch, but no one looks at him as a goal scorer. They look at him as a creator, more more so, even though he scores a whole bunch. That's what gets me. Like, imagine if Messi tried to score goals, or I've heard this a million times, yeah. if Messi was a poacher. Like, <laughs> he's so concise. What I mean by that is, like, he's able to do so much with so little. Um, whereas Cristiano Ronaldo, sometimes he needs six, seven shots to score a goal. With Messi, no, don't get me wrong, Cristiano Ronaldo is also capable of hitting one and scoring one. 
Yeah. But I mostly see it with Messi, where it's, you know, there's nothing really going on. And then many classicos in the 2013-14 class yeah. that ended 4-3 Barcelona, Messi scored a hat trick with two penalties. But his equalizer in that game was just out of nothing. Or the one in 2017 when he scored in the 92nd minute, out of nothing. Like this guy, yeah. Yeah. even Ronaldo's most uh, famous characteristic, which is being spontaneous and being able to change a game in an instant, mm. Messi's got two. And yet, it's like, it's because it's not in his like most important skill sets, or it's not like something that is in his priorities. People don't bring it up. That doesn't mean that he doesn't have it. For example, Manuel Neuer has got a pretty good weak foot. He can distribute the ball very well, mm -hmm. but you wouldn't think to yourself that that's the thing that defines him. You would yeah. think shot blocking, intimidating presence, um, and I guess skills, <laughs> because he's one yeah. of the most skillful goalkeepers. The other ever. thing is about this is, Look, Ronaldo. I bet I, this is what I believe. I, be, I believe Ronaldo deep down no thinks he's the greatest ever, but I also think Ronaldo doesn't think it's close between Messi and everybody else. In in terms of Ronaldo's mental, I believe that he believes that uh, he's the best and Messi's the second best, and then there's everybody else. Uh, you know, a ten hour airplane ride from where they are. Mm -hmm. But also, I believe that Messi not. Me I think Messi deep down knows he's the greatest footballer of all time. Easy. Easy. But he doesn't. He doesn't embrace the fact that he's the goat. He he plays it a different way. He he continues to try to strive and get better. And so does Ronaldo. In fairness, but Ronaldo feels the need to to continue to to speak out about how he's the best. And I think the only reason he feels the need to do that is because he wants to remind everyone that he's also great. Just because I think a lot of the talk is about Messi, Messi, Messi for good reason, and because Messi is such a. a you know, alien in this in this game like Ronaldo is. Ronaldo comes in this thing and he's just, that's why, I think that's why he can continue speaks out about why he's the best, where Messi never talks about how great he is. He just shows up. Um, and I think um, Gerard Piquet uh, said it best a few years, many years ago with, uh, with, a, with Rio Ferdinand, he had an interview and, he, and he, was, he was asked, what's the difference between the two? And he said, Messi's an alien out of the stratosphere. And then he said, and this is my one of my favorite quotes of all time. He described Ronaldo as the greatest of a human. So Ronaldo yeah. is the greatest human. He's the, he's the highest, you know, level of human form. And then Messi is an alien. And that's the difference between the two. And they're both un unbelievably great. And the, they all, they all sh both should be in your top three or top five, whatever you call it. Because these guys have changed the way we look at the, everything and from the ball on door to everything else. It's just, it's incredible, but it's also, it's, they're, they're both different. Ronaldo is, is comfortable speaking out and saying, I am the greatest, um, which I've never, I've never liked, but I get it. If I was Cristiano Ronaldo, I'd be saying the same thing where Messi doesn't necessarily need to, to validate. He doesn't feel the urge to, to speak out because you, you hardly ever hear him speak whatsoever. In a way, the humility is something that kind of gives just adds to it. Like, for example, with, and it's kind of a safety net, at least PR wise, where it's like you can never say Messi is arrogant or that Messi is a troublemaker. Whereas with Cristiano Ronaldo, it's been argued that one time when Atletico Madrid beat Real Madrid in 2016, yeah. Cristiano said, if everyone was on my level, he would have won the game. They misinterpreted it as like physical conditioning. Like Ronaldo yeah, yeah. was fresh off of the Wolfsburg game. Yeah. I believe at least. And so he was in a better physical condition than the other players. Yeah. And yet they took it as like, oh, if they were as good as me, we would have won. That's yeah. what the media does. With Messi, if he doesn't talk, there's no mis you know, there, it cannot be misinterpreted what was never said. Yeah. But at the same time, it can kind of play against you. Where it's like Messi's not a leader, Messi doesn't have passion, which is all all a lie. Yeah. People say Messi's not a leader, they have not watched the twenty fifteen Copa America. Mm-hmm. They have not watched the 2016 Copa America um, or any qualifying games for that matter. I think leadership is shown on the field, not verbally. Right. It's shown on the field. And Messi, when he scored that hat trick against Ecuador to send Argentina to the World Cup, if that's mm -hmm. not leadership, do you prefer Messi to be like an evangelical you know, pastor, like to talk to the team? No, Messi's forced to score the goals, scores a hat trick. I mean, no one can dispute, the, sorry, dispute it there. Yeah. But He's not a leader in the... In the He's not a leader in the same way that Iniesta and um, Pool was, but he never should have been asked to be a leader because that's not him. 
He is yeah. he's their best player. He is he does have the leadership ability, but he's not he's not what you you would refer to as a, a great captain. He's not a Maldini. He's not a Zanetti. He's not a Pool. He's not he's not a Totti. He's not a Durasi. But that doesn't mean he's not great. It's just that wasn't the role that he that he's fine with the role, but it's, it's not something that necessarily fits what Messi does. Messi, that's not who Messi is. And that's perfectly fine. You can be the greatest thing of that's ever existed and not be a great quote unquote leader where Ronaldo, I understand it when he's captain. And I think he's more of a captain characteristically speaking than Messi. You, you can make sense of it because he's very vocal and outspoken and, and, and uh, he motivates his team regularly where Messi is, is, not maybe doing the same thing, but again, that's that's what how they're different. Also, you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. But I guess that's what makes them unique. Um, you know, Cristiano Ronaldo's confidence is something that's and leadership qualities yeah. are something that this sport may never see again. Yeah. And Messi's timidness is something that well, maybe Angola Conte can be a, a similar case yeah. where like a player is very shy and likable. And for that reason, people may not take them as seriously or as like as a leader. Like, would you give N'Golo Kante your captain's armband? Yeah, sure. <laughs> I mean, like, I, I mean, I guess, but it's just you want more charismatic people in those roles. Yeah. Um, in a certain sense, and this is just uh, just to go on the Roman point. Um, Totti was a great captain, but he was. He wasn't as outspoken and animated as De Rossi was. That why that's why in, in, in Roma's world, a lot of people see De Rossi as, as the the not the superior player because it's not even close, but but more of a superior captain because it's that gladiator mentality where Totti was quiet but also a great leader. So I think Messi and Con- and, and Golconte can be leaders because Totti was quiet and and was able to to, to lead by example and all these other things. But I think most of the time you would prefer someone like Messi, I mean, sorry, sorry, by, like Ronaldo or uh, Ibrahimovic or people like that who are, who are charismatic, more outspoken and, and um, I guess more demanding to a certain extent. But again, mm-hmm. I think the Toti argument proves that someone quiet can be a captain. But I think most people would prefer someone like Ronaldo to be your captain because of like all, all the things I just mentioned. Mm. Moving on from that, who do you think is going to be, I guess, like the, like the rivalry is, if it even exists, Holland versus Mbappe or Felix or the new generation of incoming talent. Who do you think is going to be that player that's like very, like soft-spoken and yet like really badass at football, like, like Messi? For example, it doesn't have to be as good as Messi. He doesn't even have yeah. to play a similar style. Him, uh, but like a common reserve player that I would not, say okay go ahead like uh, a captain that has that calm demeanor about him maybe like an you know how Edwin van der Spar never really yelled at his defenders yeah but he was a dependable figure that had a reputation of you know demanding respect yeah I guess because of the young talents that are out there right now they're not old enough to be able to demand respect there, like who do you think in the future there's one be? of the three we're mentioning here mm-hmm. I mean, if if you're gonna throw Delit in it, Delit is is more Ronaldo like. He's outspoken. He's yelling at people. So I think he's out. Um, I guess Holland also is quite outspoken. Uh, he's in, he does a lot of interviews, things like that. So that's also more like in the uh, outspoken leader. Mbappe doesn't talk a lot, but I I think he also is quite outspoken as well. So I think Felix is the one who can be a timid captain because again, like Messi, he doesn't talk a lot. Um, but you can see him communicating with his teammates when he's playing. Um, a couple games ago, he was not chewing out, but he was, he was having a disagreement with uh, a conversation with one of, one of the attackers. I don't remember. I forgot which one, um, but he, he's not outspoken. He basically, uh, was communicating something, and then they moved on, and then a little bit later they, they got it right, and and um, and they improved on that situation. So I think if there's if there's a young captain that or a captain that it, that of the young players that could be captain that will not be as outspoken, I think is probably Felix. 
because I think Davies is outspoken, Holland's outspoken, and Bappe to a certain extent is outspoken. Um, and I don't think I think those are the main ones um, that you sort of see as sort of being um, more of a vocal type of leader. But I think I think Felix is capable of being a timid leader. Um, but again, it, it I think it all depends on a lot of different things. Um, so Felix would be the answer for the messy role in this, the the, the quiet leader. I'm, I'm not a messy role because I think Felix. I think Messi's so timid that he he can be captain, but he's not. He wouldn't be your your first choice. I think mm. I think Felix can be a little bit more outspoken than Messi is, um, because he has in the past. Um, and then for the on the opposite side of that, I think you look at someone like uh, Matthias De Litt as being a more outspoken. Uh, the Ronaldo in this in this analogy, where he's 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 speaking out constantly and and yelling at people and trying to keep everyone accountable. Um, and then obviously uh, Holland. Uh, Holland is also outspoken. Mbappe is more closer to Felix in terms of timidness, but he, I think he talks more than he does. So uh, Felix seems like the one, but again, it's it's really hard to say because all these guys are under the age of 22. So it's hard to say. Hmm. I just saw speaking like shifting up from this conversation that not a lot of people are on the same page here as to who the best player in the world is right now. I think Nelson it's an Lewandowski. open. I think it's an open open conversation right now. Is it as clear cut as as Neymar versus Lewandowski? Um, I I think now that Messi's no longer number one, as it appears that he's not, even though he's I think he's clearly number two. But but of people who who kind of understand Leo Messi isn't it anymore, I think there's arguments for a lot of different people. Um, I think there's arguments for um, uh, obviously, Neymar. Neymar is the one, um, the big main one. I think there is argument for uh, Kimmich uh, that we talked about the other week. I think there's an argument for KDB. I think there's an argument for Lewandowski. There's an argument for Moeller. Um, you can even go lower than that, and somebody who you'd have to, I guess, convince. So there's, there's some maybe lesser players, but also fantastic, like a Mo Salah or Sadio Mane, a. Um, I don't know. There's a lot of, of world-class players, but I think that conversation is a little bit more open than it was when Messi was kind of in control. So, for example, I think it's Neymar. Um, Ryan, who does the, my other podcast with me, he thinks it's, um, it's um, KDB. Um, yes, other people. Some people probably think Mueller. Um, so it's. I think it's open. I don't think it's a heated debate because Lewandowski is obviously in that as well, but I put him a little bit further back only because I think Kimmich and Mueller are more valuable to, to um, yeah. Bayern. You take Lewandowski off. You, you it's, um, I don't know how to explain it. It, it, it there's still not going to be as good because you, you just, you took out the, the, the baddest player at his position. And what I mean bad, I mean like so good. Um, like the best. Yeah. Yeah. He's a bad man, like, like they say <laughs> in the U.S. Um, so if you take him out, that Byron team probably still can win the Champions League, but it's not undisputed that they do. You put him in there, then it becomes undisputed. But if you take Mueller out, I don't think I, – I think they're, they're very beatable, considering their back line is not that great. If you take Kimmich out, they're, they're also – so it's, it's like it's one of those things where Robert's – Probably their second best player, maybe third. It depends how you want to rank it. Um, but if you take Kimmich or Mueller out of that team, it's it's le- it's harder because um, Mueller is the captain, I think, or he's him and him and um, and Norrie kind of switch off. Um, but um, Kimmich is the pulse of Bayern Munich. So if you take any of those two pieces away, and Lewandowski is still there, it's not as good. However, I think Lewandowski is very much in this conversation. As far as you can make an argument for that, um, I think there's no argument against him being the best striker in the world. I don't think it's even close. Um, all respect to, to Harry Kane and Kiro Mobley and Lukaku and um, Holland and others, but but I think it's clearly Lewandowski number one in the, in the striker position. But again, I think he comes up in this conversation who the best player in the world is, mm-hmm. but it depends on what your criteria is. If you're looking at value, then I think he ranks lower than than. Maybe 
not lower than not Kamich and Mueller, but he he definitely mm -hmm. lower ranks um, below them because I think there's more they're more valuable. But you could argue that maybe still Lemonowski is still better. So it's it's a very tricky conversation. But he's definitely involved in this. I would say most people would say it's between um, it's between K KDB, um, Neymar, Kimmich, Mueller, and Lewandowski. Those I think those are the five that are re it's really about. Um, because we're we're taking Messi out because he's no longer number one. So he's he's not going to regain that spot because he's older than all these guys. So that's the way I would kind of transcribe it. But again, it's an open conversation at this point. But my question to you is, what kind of criteria would give Joshua Kimmich a spot at a Ballon d'Or? A shot it's, a, it's not it's not possible for him to win it based on the way the the, the criteria that it's being made. He would have to have like a. Um, we we have to rem we have to keep reminding us he plays defensive midfield. He doesn't play an attacking midfield position. He's not playing a KDB position. KDB is getting a lot of goals and assists on both ends because he's playing an attacking midfield. If Joshua Kimmich had a KDB season in terms of statistics, playing in defensive midfield, and Bayern win the Champions League, and uh, the cup, and like if they do a treble where he, he has a 20, like a 2020 season, and he's doing that from the defensive midfield, then it would, then you have a case for, um, for Kimmich as, as a potential ball and door winner. But I don't think he wins it unless he has a, um, a attacking midfield output at his defensive midfield position. Um, but I think he deserves it, but the criteria is based on stats and based on, um, um, accomplishments, or at least it seems that way. Hmm. I, I agree with you. And I was thinking, uh, I believe when Lothar Matez won the Ballon d'Or, I believe in 1990, it was yeah. because Germany, Germany won the World Cup and because he's just the box-to-box -box animal who was scoring goals in a yeah. position where it wasn't even traditional or orthodox. Right. To do so. Joshua Kimmich does that too. Like, what a Champions League final goal could Joshua Kimmich, had he scored the winner against PSG, hypothetically speaking, if and what ifs, could he have cemented his place in the top three of people's minds? Probably, but but it's difficult because I think most people see KDB as superior because of his attack, because of his position mainly. Kimmich, if he scores the game-winning goal in the Champions League final. I think I think some people would move into that area where Kimmich would you could rank them third because you would see that goal and then you would look at the rest of his season and then it would justify itself. Um, but I just don't think we live in a time anymore where a defensive midfielder can win that Ballon d'Or as as difficult and as as ridiculous as that sounds. Because I would argue that defensive midfield is the most important position because they have to contribute in in both attacking both in the attack and the defense. Um, and some, sometimes acting like a security blanket to uh, a back line. But because of the way it, it has been with Messi and Ronaldo um, going back and forth, it's changed the conversation that it's more about. It's about how they played, but it's also about the stats and it's also about what they won. And um, because of that, it makes defensive midfielders difficult to, to win a, a ball and door unless you have a a outstanding World Cup where you're the best player and your team wins the Champions League. So it it take it will take a lot for not just Kimmich, but anyone that, that plays that position to win it. That makes sense. Um let's see. As we you know approach to wrap up, yeah. um just a league overview. In Syria, it's still close between Inter and AC Milan. Yeah. But with Juventus facing them Facing in sorry, Juventus facing Inter tomorrow. Yeah, and Ronaldo having the potential history shattering record on the line mm -hmm. if he scores. Um, do you think that'll be a title decider? Do you think Juventus can get back into this and pick up some pace? Yes. Or if Inter win, God. that they can like put a staple because hey, it was a Milan and now Inter Milan who have to face Juventus. If Juventus are able to beat both of them, that's kind of criteria for a champion. The winning intangible to be able to beat yeah. your rivals. It would kind of be um, embarrassing for, Inter, for, for Juventus not to win the title if they beat Inter, AC, and all these teams, and then they don't win the title. 
Yes, I think you are in it. I think it's foolish to say they're not because they have been the last decade um, and even before that. So, of course, they're the champions. They're going to be in it, and they're going to – as poor as they can be, they're picking up the points that that will justify that. But I don't think that's enough because they didn't pl- they didn't play a real AC Milan. They played a you know a AC Milan team with a lot of really important pieces in this team. So Milan are still very much in favor because even though the gap is closing, after losing to Juventus, Milan went out and won again, and. Then they, you know, so if if Milan continues to win, I I just don't see. I it's a for if Inter loses, they're out of the title race. But if if Juventus, but if Juventus wins or something, that doesn't necessarily mean necessarily that Juventus then becomes the favorites. I think AC Milan are the favorites until further notice, and people are kind of not talking about this because a lot of people don't watch Serie A um, as much as some of the other leagues. The midfield that they just got from Torino kind of solidifies some of their issues in that area. So even though on paper it doesn't look like AC Milan have an incredible team, I just, with Zlatan coming back and Theo playing well and Kessie being great and uh, Tonalu being amazing, Donnarumma stopping the goals and having a really strong defense and and being involved in all these games and not really being threatened in, in terms of losing situations that often. It, I just I just can't – at this point, right now, I can't see past AC Milan. I think it's possible Juventus gets second. But at this point, I think Milan should only be worrying about themselves. If they continue to play the way they have the rest of the season, if they have the first half of the season, again, throughout the rest of the season, even if Juventus beats Inter, I don't think it necessarily changes it. It means everything for Inter, but it's not necessarily a title-deciding moment for Juventus, in my opinion. Hmm. We'll definitely have to wait and see for that. And oh, by the way, no. I, before we do wrap up, Bayern Munich got knocked out of the cha- uh, cup by yeah, a second. I, I watched the highlights. All those penalties were top notch. Like even the they kept saying, oh, "This player from South Korea is gonna miss. He's gonna miss," and he scored it. And then Mark Roca, Spanish international, missing. Yeah. And then there was this guy. I'm so sorry if I don't remember from Kiel, but they said he had never beaten Bayern before, yeah. and to knock them off in their, you know, resurgent prime their second dynasty must feel good. Now they're not going to win the trouble again. But I know. If they win the double, we talked about cool. potentially them going back to back trebles. That's not going to happen anymore. And well, go ahead. That's, but Hey, the champions league is all anyone cares about. When Madrid won their three champions leagues, they won champions league. Yeah. Champions league league. And then champions league, nothing else. Yeah. They would have gone and, trophy less if they didn't win the champions. League. And I want to reiterate this. They're more likely to lose in the Bundesliga or to do not retain in the Bundesliga than lose in the Champions League. Makes sense. They're Champions League just because the way the Champions League is set up. And again, I think they're playing in the best league. They're being challenged by everybody. And in these competitions where they're better than everybody just because their their team is way better than everyone, it's going to be more difficult to beat them over two games. You can get past them for a one game off. Um, if our if you know um, if Gladbach and Bayern Munich played again. I think Bayern probably would win. So it's just in the league, they're more likely to drop points and to lose games and to potentially uh, throw away the title, not throw away, but get beaten to the league title than than losing the Champions League. I think the Champions League is pretty much a done deal. However, the Bundesliga is open. They could get, they could not retain their, their title. Um, Whether it's, I mean, it has to be RB Leipzig because I don't think Dortmund can, can maintain and I think Bayer Leverkusen is a nice story, but I don't think they have enough um, really to win the Le- Bundesliga. But as far as just looking at this from a logical perspective, they're much more likely to lose in, to lose the Bundesliga title than the Champions League. So that's what it comes down to in the end as well. But but like we always end the podcast with the same. It's still early in the season. Yeah. Once the knockouts start, we are in January approaching the midpoint. So. Once February, you know, 5th, 6th comes around, Valentine's Day, that's when the knockouts in the Champions League start. And that's where yeah. seasons end. Right. Manchester City what could if, end their season against Bayern. Right, what if, so, and this hypothetically, and I know Bayern are going to win um, against Lazio, um, hopefully by a lot after what happened yesterday. Um, but this is, this is my theory. Um, 
and I, it's, it's hard to say it's a done deal before it's before the fat lady sings. But given the, the given their defensive issues this season, if they blank them twice, I I feel like that is. It's just like one of those things where it's like it's gonna feel over even against Lazio, even if they win 12 2 on aggregate, if they concede, it at least gives someone else a fighting chance to beat them. But if they shut them out, and again, Lazio have a Mobile, they have Luis Alberto, they have Olinka and Savage, they have enough pieces to score against this Bayern Munich team. They won't win the tie, but if 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 Bayern can shut out shut them out over two games, then I think it tells a whole totally different complexion about how dominant this team can be in the Champions League. Because I just expect them, because of their defensive issues outside of Benjamin Pavard, um, I feel like they're just bound to concede one or two. And if they don't, I think it, it basically reiterates that they're not going to be stopped. If they concede, then I guess to a certain respect, there's still a chance for someone. I think it's an unlikely chance. But it almost feels like if they, con- if they don't concede any goals – against uh, Lazio, it's a done deal because their defensive issues are issues. They're they're conceding to teams that they shouldn't be conceding to that are not as good as Lazio. So if they concede to Lazio, then, again, still winning it, but there's still a chance for someone. If they shut them out twice, there's no chance for anyone. That's just the way I look at it. I don't think they're going to shut them out. Me, for- me- me either. But if they do, I think it, it basically says, good luck. <laughs> because you can say what you want, penalty this, penalty that. Kiro Mobile is a great striker. He, he, if he, and, and they have Alberto and Savage in the midfield. If they're able to shut them out completely, just doors blown off, not a goal, nobody's going to beat them. It's over. <laughs> if, they, if they just shut them out twice, it's over. I don't care what anybody says. There's no chance for anybody if they can, if they shut them out. Again, I don't think they do. I think, I think they'll probably win like nine three on aggregate. I, I can. I think. I was gonna say five one aggregate, three one two nil. I think that sounds good. But then you have Chelsea. I don't know. I, I just feel like at home they're gonna rip them apart. So I think that you could get like a a five one win, and then um, a three two. But if they concede. Again, I know I'm kind of repeating myself here, but if they shut them out completely, then it's it's over. But if they concede, then even though it's unlikely, teams that t- teams that have the materials, meaning PSG, probably only PSG, but they might have a fighting chance. That's all I'm saying. So it'll really depend what happens in that game in terms of defensively for Bayern, for Bayern Munich. All we can guarantee is that Inter will win the Champions League this season. <laughs> and, yeah, Inter Man United in the final. <laughs> that's the perfect way to end it all all right guys it's been another episode of the full Packs podcast here with elliot next week catch us because we won't know whether ronaldo is the top scorer of all time what we will know is more about the title race in syria and even the bundesliga so catch you guys until then it's been another episode of the full Packs podcast